Hello and welcome to the final part of Lecture 6 on this course on Computational Fluid Dynamics. In the final part of this lecture, we're going to examine a type of discretization scheme that is yet more accurate than the multipoint schemes of SPUDS and QUIC that we examined in the last part of this lecture. These schemes are called flux limiting schemes. Now, typically, flux limiting schemes would only be used in problems that have very, very sharp gradients. Physically, these might appear as shock waves in aerodynamics or as phase boundaries in immiscible two-phase flows. These sharp boundaries would be poorly resolved with multipoint schemes, and thus the resulting solution would be unphysical. Flux limiting schemes are more complex than their multipoint counterparts. We will see that the matrix M needs constructing at each iteration step, and that consequently more memory and more CPU time is required when they are used. We will demonstrate, however, that they can resolve sharp gradients very, very well indeed, thus motivating their use for the class of problem that we're describing. We're going to introduce a scheme called the Van Leer Flux Limiter. Although not implemented in Fluent, it illustrates the principle very well. The scheme implemented within Fluent, which is abbreviated as Muscle, however, was authored by the same person, Professor Van Leer, and so it seems fitting to use his original flux limiting formulation to illustrate the mechanism of the algorithm. Now, flux limiting schemes are very often used for highly convective problems with sharp fronts, hence shock waves in aerodynamics, phase boundaries within two-phase flow. You'll find that flux limiting schemes also go by another name, which are total variation diminishing schemes. The key to these schemes is that the resolution with which they discretize the problem actually changes with the gradient of the problem. Now, we're going to illustrate this by means of an example. So let's talk through the various steps involved within the Van Leer Flux Limiter. It all starts with taking a gradient. Let's say we've got a first order derivative, partial dc by partial dx, much as we would do in the discretization that we would do on a transport equation. So dc by dx here would be the convection term in one dimension. We're going to approximate it uh, first of all as an upwind difference multiplied by a weighting factor. We know that we would never use an upwind difference on its own, it's too inaccurate, but this weighting factor w is really quite clever. Now the weighting factor can be written in terms of a sum of this function phi. Phi here is our flux limiter. So we'll see that our flux limiter is evaluated both at node i and at its upwind counterpart, node i minus 1. Now our flux limiter phi is evaluated in terms of something called r, which is called a gradient sensor. And our gradient sensor in this case is going to be written as the ratio of two gradients. A gradient taken at a half point downwind at i plus a half and a half point upwind at i minus a half. So at node i we've got an accurate picture of what the gradient's doing. So we've got our gradient sensor which in turn determines the value of my flux limiter, which in turn determines the value of the weighting function, which in turn governs how the discretization for my gradient actually is made. And if we think about computing a solution to a mass transfer problem. I've written this in concentration terms to be compatible with our mental model of injecting a pulse of dye tracer. As we time step, or as we resolve a spatial gradient, we will see that our gradients are going to change because our concentration field changes. And as our concentration field changes, our gradient sensor R is going to change, which means that my flux limiting function phi is going to change which consequently means that the weighting function w is going to change, which ultimately means that the way in which this gradient is discretized will change at every time step. So we need to be able to reconstruct that matrix of multipliers every time step. Let's now plot what these various functions look like. The plot I've put on the board here is my flux limiting function phi as a function of my gradient sensor r. Remember, r was that ratio of two gradients, just a little bit either side of the point of interest, and phi was written as a function of r. We can see that phi, my flux limiting function, varies between two limits. At negative r, we've got my flux limiting function equal to zero. We've got a transition region, 
and then as r increases phi equals 2. Now let's look at these regions in a little bit more detail. Where our gradient changes sign, our flux limiting function equals 0. OK, so when my gradient tensor r is less than 0, that is where my gradient is changing sign. Now, if we've got a mild gradient change, it's going to correspond to a relatively small band of positive r. And where my gradient sensor has these small values, my flux limiting function will vary smoothly between 0 and 2. Now, if my gradient change is very, very strong, then my value of r, my gradient sensor, is going to be large, which in turn results in an asymptotic solution to my flux limiting function. It stays at 2. And so according to the nature of the gradient in the problem, my flux limiting function will change adaptively, which is what gives this discretization method its power and its utility. Now, what we find is that there are many different flux limiting schemes in common use. We've described the Van Leer flux limiter. It was first invented in 1974. There are subsequent modifications and simplifications of this. What we find is that the flux limiting function always varies between 0 and 2. It's what happens in the transition region, according to the gradient sensor, that is different. And so you find the MC flux limiter, which was another of Professor Van Leer's formulations in 1977, has a simple minimum or maximum function written as that change. What you find is that the idea was adopted by other authors in the mid-80s. Rowe came up with a super B flux limiter, uh, which is written again as a minima and maxima. And then finally, Leonard in 1987 came up with a modified version of the quick algorithm, which again is flux limiting in nature, with a flux limiter written as I've done on the board there. So the take home message is that there are many different types of flux limiting um, formulation, but they all effectively operate in a very, very similar way. Now, this is the $100 million question, isn't it? How does the Van Leer flux limiter alter the solution to our wave equation problem? This was our square pulse of tracer being injected within a flow with diffusion turned off, so an infinite Peclet number on a relatively coarse finite difference grid. If you look at the animation that is playing on the whiteboard, you'll see actually it's doing remarkably well. We could improve its performance even more by increasing the grid resolution, but again I've used a coarse grid purposefully here to try and needle out if there are any problems with the method. And it is working very accurately. So here's a summary of what the Van Leer flux limiter was doing. Um, the complexity and the pain in programming it, because this again was demonstrated in MATLAB, is definitely worth solving the problem in this way. So if you've got a phase boundary, we can imagine we keep a clean phase boundary now, for example, as a bubble moves through a tube. Now, within Fluent, you won't find the Van Leer flux limiter natively. You'll find something called a MUSCLE scheme. Now, MUSCLE stands for Monotonic Upwind Scheme for Conservation Laws, and it's another one of Professor Bram Van Leer's flux limiting schemes. This one was 1979. Now, it's going to be a very good choice of discretization scheme, as I said, if you've got sharp discontinuities. It's not a good choice if you haven't got that because of its higher memory and CPU overhead. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the muscle scheme here, but I have put the original paper on Moodle for you to read for those of you who are interested. So let's recap some pros and cons of flux limiting schemes. Now, we start by saying, Major pro, they are far more accurate than both the multipoint schemes and simple upwinding schemes for when you have these problems with very, very sharp gradients. Imagine shock waves, imagine two phase flows. If you're having to program them and you're sitting in the computational fluid dynamics course, not a numerical methods course, so you won't have to program them, but if you were to, they are more tricky, especially when you have multiple spatial dimensions. The downside is that that sparse matrix M needs to be constructed at each and every time step. And so you've got an extra matrix construction um, time period, and then that will become a slowing down, if you like, of the algorithm that you program. It's, it's more computationally intensive. Now, 
If these schemes aren't accurate enough for the problem being solved, there are other schemes that you can use as well, which are even more complex and even more computationally intensive. These are called total variation, sorry, essentially non-oscillatory schemes, but we're not going to go into those in this lecture. So here's the number of it. Let's look in Fluent how you choose a discretization method. On the whiteboard here, I've put a screenshot of the solution methods box that you'll find when you start to set up your problem. And remember that we said that these upwind or upwind bias schemes only concern the quantity that is the subject of that convective derivative. So it's the v dot grad v in the case of um, the Navier-Stokes equations, or v dot grad t in the case of energy transport, or v dot grad c in the case of mass transport. That's why you will only find the various upwind options under the momentum box within your discretization page, because it's the momentum terms is the v dot grad v. So you'll see that you've got your first order upwind scheme available for use. Beware, we've covered the pros and cons of first order upwind schemes. Remember that they can lose mass and they can introduce numerical diffusion. So use with care. I'd recommend it, don't use them. Go for a higher order accurate scheme. You've got your quick scheme here. So that's quadratic upstream interpolation for convective kinetics. It's our multi-point upwind biased scheme, third order accurate. In my view, this should be your default choice to use. You've also got your flux limiting scheme here, a third order muscle scheme. If you've got sharp boundaries, so shock waves or two phase flows, that you would use in preference to quick. So that is the meaning of these upwind schemes and those are the pros and cons of their use. So let's recap a few key points. If you find that you're dealing with problems that involve very, very sharp gradients, and in a sense this 1D wave equation is a very good example of that, then multipoint schemes probably won't be accurate enough. There is a set of schemes instead called flux limiters that are very, very good for using in these contexts. So flux limiting schemes rely on sensing the spatial gradient within the problem and dynamically changing the spatial discretization accordingly. Consequently, flux limiting schemes are more computationally intensive. So do be aware of additional resource usage and additional memory overhead. Make sure that you've got enough memory in the machine that you're using to accommodate these methods. Within Fluent, the flux limiting scheme that you'll find is the muscle scheme, and you'll probably only need to use this if you're dealing with compressible flows where you're going to have shock waves, or if you're dealing with two-phase flows that are immiscible where you're going to have phase boundaries.